welcome to Pep Talks this evening. I am Jenna Snyder, the Director of Guidance Counseling and Upper School Guidance Counselor, and we are so happy that you're with us tonight. I'd like to introduce our student services team, at least the Guidance Counseling Division of our student services team. So again, I'm Jenna Snyder, a director, and then I, upper, I counsel the upper school students. And Dr. Lana Sneer is our South Campus counselor. She is wonderful. If you've not had the chance to connect with Dr. Sneer, I urge you to do that. She's fantastic. We also have Daniel Townsley, who's not with us on the call tonight, but he is absolutely an integral part and has done a whole lot to make uh, this event and this whole program honestly possible. So we're thrilled um, that Daniel is leading us. And we'd love for you to mark your calendars for future pep talks. I don't know if this is your first pep talk or maybe you are a regular attender, but uh, these are just wonderful, rich times that you can set aside as a family. Um, we know you're busy. We know you have so much going on. So we're really glad you joined us this evening and we hope you'll mark your calendars for these upcoming events. We have one February 8th. And this one is Teaching Diversity God's Way, A Parent's Guide in Light of Current Events. And Dr. Kenneth Chapman spoke to our faculty and he is just fantastic. So certainly a tricky uh, subject in today's world and we know you'll wanna tune in for that one. On March 29th, we have The Pursuit, Hope for Purity in a Sexualized Digital Age. And we have Dan Martin of Pure Hope, which is just a fantastic organization that's really done a lot. Um, and I know some of you have younger kids, but honestly, there you can never start too soon in our world with um, trying to instill purity in light of, of all the technology and things that are, that are happening with our kids. So please mark your calendar for those two dates. And um, now I'll go back to you, Lana, if you wouldn't mind opening us in prayer. Absolutely. Please bow with me. Dear Father, we, uh, Father, we love you. And Father, I've never been more grateful to be a part of your flock, to know, Father, that you are going before us, behind us, beside us, all around us, Father. Um, we are just blessed to be your people. Father, I thank you for tonight, for an opportunity to come together, to encourage one another, to learn together, to grow together. Father, um, we have had the immense pleasure of listening to Rob speak before, and Father, he, he brings your word, and he brings it in such a, a loving and generous way, Father. And um, Lord, I'm just looking forward to what he has to share with us tonight. Father, I pray that you will speak through him, that you will clear his mind, that you will um, provide him just the right words, Father. And for all of us at home, Lord, just uh, clear our hearts and open our ears, Father, and uh, just bring to us exactly what we need at this time. Father, it's a trying time, but Father, it is your time. It all belongs to you. In your name we pray, amen. So Dr. Rob Reno, uh, his most important ministry is loving his wife, Amy, and partnering with her to lead their seven children to love God. Yes, I said seven children that they have together. I think he can tell us, but I think the ages were something like seven years to 23, maybe-ish, uh, but definitely a wealth of knowledge. He is the founder of Visionary Family Ministries. Um, I'm going to give you that website later on with our resources. He's a pastor, an international conference speaker, and the author of several books, including Visionary Parenting and Visionary Marriage. When Rob is not fishing for men, he enjoys fishing for fish. <laughs> the Reno family lives in West Chicago, Illinois. Please join me in welcoming Rob Reno. All right. Good evening, everyone. I have been looking forward to this time with you. I'm sorry that we can't be in person. I just had such a great um, evening with you. This must have been a couple years ago now that I was able to uh, come spend a night with you talking about parenting and these kids that God's given us. So I'm sorry we can't be together in person, but thank you for 
uh, inviting me back. Well, as Jenna just said, I've got uh, this big family. I wanted to give a share a picture so you could see. Amy and I have been married for 26 years. We have seven children, four boys and three girls, ages 23 to six. Now, if you're doing a quick count on that picture, you might see eight children and you'd be right because uh, over on the far left of your screen, I think it is, my eldest son has his hand on his now wife, our new daughter-in-law, Emily. They got married a month ago. So we have, uh, we've got seven children and a new daughter-in-law, so I'm gonna count that eight. So we're so, so thankful. Now with a big family, you know, like ours, we've got, uh, we've got lots of joy, lots of happiness, uh, lots of problems, like daily, daily problems. Not, not a day goes by where we don't have conflict, sin, things get messed up uh, pretty quick around here. So we're, we're a pretty um, needy group when it comes to our relationships and being needy of God's mercy and grace uh, in our family every day. Now, um, for those of you maybe that were with me when I was down in person with you, or if you connected with me online, hopefully you, you've gotten the sense. I, I tend to be kind of an optimistic person. I'm a pretty up person, pretty positive person. I was in a church meeting a little while ago, and I said, well, you guys know I'm glass half full. And one of the pastors says, no, you're glass three quarters full. And that's probably true. I'm, I'm just a generally positively wired type of person. Um, but I am right now, when it comes to families around the country, incredibly burdened and incredibly concerned uh, about some of the things that are happening in our churches and in our families as we are going through this pandemic season. So as tonight I'm preparing and we're going to talk about pandemic parenting, you're, some of my uh, burden uh, and concern is going to come through with, with a little bit of uh, intensity. I don't mean it to be overly intense, but uh, I, I am really concerned with some of the things that are happening in our families and in our churches. You know, in our churches right now, I was talking with a friend, uh, a pastor friend, who was talking about how divisive things are in their church right now. And he explained to me, he said, you know, we've got four major conflicts going on in our church right now as it relates to the pandemic. So we've got some people in our church, they have never been sick. They don't know anybody who's been sick. We've got other folks in our church that have lost a loved one. Grandma passed away or a friend of theirs has passed away from this. So that creates this big divide. He said, financially, we've got this huge divide in our churches. We've got some folks financially doing great through this thing and other folks that are, are uh, losing their homes or they're going into debt and there's this huge divide. We also have this huge divide in our churches over like who your favorite YouTube doctor is or what scientist you listen to, right? And we pass our links back and forth about, about who we believe. And then you add the political uh, divide in our churches. And, and we've just got a, a recipe for uh, extremely difficult times. And I think Satan and the demons are having a field day when it comes to this divide and conquer uh, approach that they are so, so good at. And all of that conflict and all of that pressure, it's also getting into our, our families. You know, on the political side, you know, you know what a lot of our counseling is right now for families? It's for parents who have adult children, specifically college-age children, who are coming home from college with Marxist ideology and telling their parents, you're never going to see me again as long as you hold on to those traditional values. As long as you're a hater, as long as you're a racist, in other words, as long as you're not a Marxist like me, I'm not going to have any relationship with you. This is happening in Christian families where kids have been raised in church or kids have been raised in Christian school. Uh, the, the horror stories that I could tell you right now would, would blow your mind. So there, this, this subject tonight of, of how are we going to engage with the hearts of our kids during this pandemic is, is really, really important. As Jenna said before, my goal is to uh, not take all of our time talking, but uh, go through the things that I want to share as quickly as I can. 
and then leave it room for, for open season questions. But I wanna talk with you about four areas that I'm gonna give you four challenges in your parenting mission during this uh, pandemic time. I wanna challenge you to respond to anxiety. I'm gonna challenge you to strengthen family worship. I'm gonna encourage you to reconnect with church and then seek first his kingdom. So let me walk through uh, each one of these with you. And the first one is, is to respond to anxiety. When COVID first hit back in March, the, you know, the world shut down. Uh, and, and what I realized in my life, so I usually I travel, I'm doing conferences and seminars, that my life, uh, my work life, if you will, went on pause. In other words, things that I normally do, I couldn't do, but someday in the future, they'll be unpaused. This, this isn't going to last forever. It might be months or years. I don't know, but it's not going to be forever. I'm going to unpause. But my kids experiencing something different, they didn't just experience um, pausing of certain things. They actually had losses, uh, particularly our older children. They had things that they were looking forward to, whether those be proms, whether those be graduations, whether those be sports seasons or trips that, that aren't coming back, you know, that, that they got canceled and they, they disappeared. Um, Mike, I just had one the other day. Mike, I have a freshman in college son and he plays basketball in college. He's on the JV team as a freshman. Just got word the other day that they've canceled the JV season up until January 1st um, because they can only have 25 players in the gym. Here in Illinois, you have a 25 people allowed in a room at a time rule from our governor. So the gym is a room and you can only have 25 people in the room so they can only have the varsity team. So here he is with another, um, I guess that's sort of a pause, but, but it's a loss. Here he's gone off to college to you know engage in this his first season of college basketball. And it creates this, this loss for him. Uh, lots of our kids, all the, the masks and all the distancing and all the shutdown, and I'm not making any commentary on masks and distancing. I'm saying it just is what it is. Kids are wearing masks, kids are distancing. It, it is separating them from their usual relationships. And it is causing a lot of depression in our kids, loneliness in our kids, discouragement in our kids. Um, again, I'm not commenting on whether we should be doing those things or not. What I'm trying to say is, is if you think you have had a lot of stress and anxiety and topsy-turvy in your life, I want to suggest our kids probably have just as much and, and if not more. And one of the questions I'd ask you is, you know, when you're having a day um, when you're stressed out, okay, you're anxious, you're overwhelmed, maybe you're just having a bad day. What do you look for from people that you live with? What do you look for from your family? If you woke, woke up on the wrong side of the bed or you're just overwhelmed, freaked out, whatever it is, you're looking for um, some understanding. You're looking for some compassion. You're looking for some tolerance. You're looking for kind of people to give you a little, a little space and a little mercy and like permission to have a bad day or permission to be overwhelmed. And one of the things that I realized about myself and my parenting through this, my kids were getting discouraged. My kids were feeling lonely. My kids were grieving losses. And I'm like, hey, come on, snap out of it. You know, God's in control. It's going to be fine. Imagine if, you know, people said that to me when I was feeling burdened or overwhelmed, if they responded with like a, hey, snap out of it, or sort of a flippant Sunday school sort of answer. We've got to be giving our kids the, the same kind of emotional respect and relational respect that we would want. Your kids are going to be riding a roller coaster through this thing. They are going to have some bad days. They are going to have some times of anxiety. They're going to have some times of loneliness. And they need us coming in. There's not a, a quick fix for those things. There's not a five, you know, a one sentence Jesus thing that you say to break a child out of fear and anxiety and loneliness. They need a lot of, boy, I understand that you feel that way. If I was going through what you were going through in fifth grade, you know, I feel, I think I would have the exact same feelings that you're having to get into that space with our kids, uh, with our kids to help. The other thing that I realized that I've been doing that, that I'm asking God to help me not do, and this is particularly for my elementary school kids, with all the stress that they're dealing with in the world, 
our homes have got to be a refuge for them. Um, with our older kids, um, not only can we not really protect them from the chaos that's out there, the ideological chaos, political chaos, all that stuff, um, but it's probably good for them to be exposed to some of it. But, but you know, I got a first grader. My first grader doesn't need the burden of what's going on in our country now. My first grader doesn't need the, the stress of all that. And even through this last week with the election, I had to catch myself so many times. You know, I'm glued to my phone and I'm going around, I'm checking this and I'm checking this. What's the latest this, latest this? And I'm tense and I'm frustrated. He's like, hey, dad, can we do horsey ride? I'm like, no, we can't do horsey ride. He's like, oh, okay, sorry. You know, I, <laughs> not good parenting right there, right? I'm bringing the, the chaos of the culture and all the pressure that's on me, right? Into my home and into my first grader's life. And he doesn't need that. So we've got to be wiser as parents when it comes to setting some boundaries, even in our own heart and in our own space and at home, that we're gonna create our home as a refuge for our kids from this stuff. Uh, and we're not gonna make our home a chaotic place because they've got enough of that out there already. So what are we gonna do with anxiety? You're probably familiar with Philippians chapter four. This passage is so awesome. It says, the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. I love that command. Do not be anxious about anything. It's like, thanks a lot, God. Well, I am anxious. Um, but then God gives us this kind of remedy. He says, so don't be anxious about anything. But when you are anxious, stressed, overwhelmed, in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So I want to give you two encouragements with this. Obviously, God says that when you're stressed, when you're anxious, our response needs to be to pray. We're going to pray with thanksgiving, and then we're going to make our requests known to God. But here's, here's two areas where I fall short. One is I will talk about praying more than I'll actually pray. So Amy and I will be talking about something, something we're stressed about or burdened about. And I'll say to her, honey, we really ought to pray about that tonight. And so for me saying, I think we ought to pray about it, somehow in my mind, like I actually checked the box that I did pray about it just by saying, I think I should pray about it. Like I gave myself credit for the actual prayer, even though I never prayed. So we've got to move past, um, yeah, it would be a good idea if we prayed about that to actually praying about it. And then trying to retrain ourselves and train your kids. Listen, th this, this instruction here in Philippians 4 is this, this call to Christians that as soon as you feel your spirit, or if you want to just describe it kind of like as your gut, as soon as you feel like your gut turn, like, oh, I'm so frustrated, I'm so anxious, I'm upset, I'm worried. As soon as you feel that inner turmoil, that's your trigger to pray. That's your trigger to immediately, okay, God, I thank you. I even thank you for this trial that I'm going through. But Lord, I need help. I need peace. Uh, I need a, you to uh, swoop in. I need you to deal with this crisis that I'm dealing with, whatever it is, so that we're just become habitual in when anxiety hits. We, we ourselves as parents, but we're also training our kids to instinctively turn to God and pray. Next area I want to talk to you about is strengthening family worship. You know, when COVID hit, there was this silver lining that almost every Christian family was aware of in the first few, even in the first few weeks. There was this silver lining that as, as our life outside the house either shut down or pulled back. You see, we were pulled into the home more than usual. And I think all of us realized hey, this is kind of a good thing in the sense that we've got more time with our families. We've got some more time with our kids. Mom or dad is working from home maybe more. Kids are hybridizing or, you know, maybe actually back in the spring, a lot of us, you know, here in Illinois, kids came home and they were doing Zoom the, the rest of the way. And I know every state is, is different. And so for some Christian families, back in the spring, that meant um, more family prayer time, more family scripture time, more family relationships time. But I'll tell you what I'm seeing right now as we've gotten into the fall and now toward the winter. 
I'm seeing this in families all over the country, a spiritual exhaustion, a spiritual heaviness, a spiritual apathy, a, a, a disconnection both from family relationships and spiritual relationships in the home. And that kind of fresh, hey, this is an opportunity to be closer together and to draw closer to God through our family prayer and family Bible time, that's our family worship time, we are seeing in families all over the country right now that that's actually on the back burner. And I, this scripture uh, is the one that absolutely changed my life in regards to uh, family prayer and family worship. Because you know my story, first seven years of our family, I was not leading our family in any kind of family prayer, any kind of uh, uh, family Bible. And God used this scripture to turn me around. Deuteronomy chapter six says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. I had grown up in church, a pastor, all that stuff. The first part of the scripture I was very familiar with, okay? Uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These commands I give to you today are to be upon your hearts, right? God wants me to love him. God wants his word in my heart. But I had never kept reading to then God speaks to parents and he speaks to grandparents. He's like, hey, if you want to love me, mission number one is help the kids love me. And if you want my word in your heart, mission number one is to help the kids have my word in, in their heart. And, and the beginning or the middle there of, of, of verse seven, you shall teach them diligently to your children and talk about God's word when you sit at home. That, that, that connection point for me of love God with all my heart and open his book at home with my family. I just had never seen like family worship as the first action step for me as a Christian father and, and the first action step really for our, for our family. So what do we do with this one? Listen, if you, for any reason, have had your family prayer time, your family Bible time, move to the back burner, or you've never gotten it started, it doesn't matter to me where, what the past has been. Repent now. Just go to God. Just say, Lord, I've fallen short in this area of my life. Thank you for forgiveness and mercy and grace through Jesus. Go to your family, repent. You say, this is a time, maybe more than ever in our families, that we need to be unifying together in this house in prayer and with God's word open. One of the ways, real practical ways that you um, might kind of reboot your, your prayer time, we like doing a thing called high-low. High-low, we usually do it at the dinner table, is we just ask the kids to go around and say, hey, what was the high part of your day today? What was the best part of your day? And kids say, oh, I had this, I had this, I had this. And then we'll just ask if there's someone who's willing to pray and thank God for those things. And then we'll say, hey, does anybody have a low? What was the hardest part of your day? And we don't make our kids share if they don't want to. Um, and a kid will say, yeah, I had this and yeah, I had this. And then we'll just ask for prayer. Could someone lift up those, those difficult parts, those low parts? High low is great on so many levels. It lets you as a family share your hearts with each other. There's a lot of highs and a lot of lows that go by that never get shared because life's nuts and, and busy. So it lets you share your hearts with each other, but it also gives you opportunity for Thanksgiving. And it also gives you uh, opportunity to lift up needs that your family has to the Lord. All right, number three, reconnect with church. Reconnect with church. COVID hits and pretty much all our churches went online, right? At least for uh, a few weeks. And it was kind of cool. Uh, it was actually a little nice. You're in your pajamas, you got your coffee. This is not a terrible thing, right? I mean, maybe sacrilegious to say that, I don't know. But uh, as the weeks went on, um, not so fun anymore. And you quickly begin to realize that a screen uh, can't be your church. And what happened then in the summer, I'll just speak for my state, man, every, every state's a little different. Here in Illinois, a lot of churches started to reopen in June. Uh, and most of them did like partial reopening. So, you know, you can get so many people in the sanctuary, you register before you come, social distancing. And then we've still got our online service. 
And so fam some families might go back a little bit and you go online and you go back a little bit. And here's what's happening statistically right now with young families around the country. Young families around the country stopped going to church online because it's not church. It, it doesn't, it, it's not what God intended for you to sit in front of a TV screen. And young families are not back to church in person either. We've got, the statistics are terrible. We've got tons of families that used to be in church almost every single Sunday, rarely in church now. And when I say rarely in church, I mean rarely in church in person or online. I'll tell you, this, this freaked me out, okay, personally. It was early September, and it was Saturday. Now, at our church, you got to send an email. You got to register before you go, all that kind of stuff. That's fine. So it's Saturday, and we had had kind of a full weekend, and, you know, next tomorrow Sunday. And I'm like, I hadn't registered for church yet. And I literally said, you know what, why don't we just go online? What's the deal? We'll just go online. Now, listen, any family that feels uncomfortable going to church physically because of COVID or something like that, man, I totally understand that. I totally respect that. That's, that's not what I'm talking about here. We, we, we were healthy. We felt like it was a safe thing to go to, to church. That was not what was keeping me back. What was keeping me back was in even in our family, was like this spiritual laziness or this spiritual inertia or this spiritual apathy of, oh, just online church is, you know, just a lot easier. And I'm like, holy cow, if that's happening in our family, I hope you get the sense that we take our faith seriously in the Reno family, all right? <laughs> At least we're trying to. Um, if that's happening in our family, how many families is it, is it happening in? Look at this, look at this scripture here. Uh, I think I've got it. Oh, and I don't. All right. Something happened with my slides. That's okay. I'll just, you know, let's see. Oh, they got jumbled around a little bit. Sorry. Well, I'll, talk, I'll, I'll put that one up later as soon as I can find it. But you're familiar with the scripture in Hebrews chapter 10. It says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting meeting together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. And listen, my, here's my concern. We've got families that are falling out of the habit of being in church every Sunday. And, and I, by habit, I'm using that as a good word, okay? I'm not talking about like a, a rote religion that doesn't mean anything, like check a box, I went to church sort of thing. It, it ought to be the habit of God's people that we are in church, either online, if that's what we need to do, or in person. I had a pastor friend from Texas talk to me recently, and he said that um, at, at their church, they have uh, a mask requirement, okay? I know every church does things differently, and I'm not, I'm not making a commentary about that. Um, he says he got a bunch of families in church. They refuse to come to church because of the mask mandate, because of their personal feelings about masks. But they are on the football sidelines Sunday afternoons watching their kids play football with their masks on because the football league requires everybody in the stands to have their masks on. So he's like, they're going to go to church. They're going to go watch their kids play football with a mask. The mask isn't stopping them there, but they're not coming to church because we've got a mask requirement here at church. Again, I am not making a comment about masks, friends. Here's what I'm trying to say. It is every single Sunday that's possible, and I'm also not saying it's a sin to miss church. I'm saying every single Sunday that is possible, okay, you have your family in church, either online or uh, in person, okay? We, we, and the driver, listen, the driver for this is not habit, or discipline. You know what the key driver is for your kids to see when it comes to church? It's neediness. It's neediness. That mom and dad ought to have a, a, a hunger and a thirst to be with the people of God, to get the feeding from God's word, to be a part of corporate worship that, that when we can't get it, 
or when online lasts too long, we just have the attitude, I just can't wait to get back to church. I'm feeling hungry. I'm feeling thirsty, like I'm feeling, I'm feeling weak. And that then sets into place the, the kind of the proper spiritual drive, this drive of neediness versus discipline, and, and we just have to do this. And bluntly, if a month goes by or however many months or weeks go by and we're not physically in church with our brothers and sisters in Christ and we're not feeling hungry and we're not feeling needy, that would be something to take to the Lord. And to go to God and say, okay, God, I haven't had a real meal spiritually with my church family. I've had my family worship meal, my individual meal, but I haven't had my meal with a church family for two months and I'm not hungry. What's wrong? What's going on inside of my spirit? See, when, it, when a person's really sick, they lose their appetite. Like if you've got somebody in the hospital and they stop eating, and they say, I'm not hungry, that's when you really, really get worried about them. And the same is true when it comes to spiritual things. Okay, one last area I want to challenge you on, and I want to title this last section, if you've got that outline you're tracking along, Seek First His Kingdom. Seek First His Kingdom. Um, I'm seeing with parents right now that we're stressed out about a lot of the wrong things. We are stressed out about our kids falling behind academically because of all this Zoom stuff. We are stressed out about our kids falling behind in sports because this season got delayed and those practices aren't happening and all that. Or they're falling behind uh, musically or, or whatever. And my concern, my burden right now, you know, the, the headlines in our world right now every day is sickness and the fear of death and riots and protests and unrest. I mean, that's what's in the headlines right now. And, and when it comes to God's people and our response, the, the response to all that is we don't need like more smart people. We don't need more athletic people. We don't need more musical people. We need more people who love Jesus more than anything else. And, and this is going to get reflected in our parenting. Our kids see the, the chaos that the world is in right now. And if we as parents are locked in on get your grades up and do your homework and you need to be kicking butt on the basketball court or the football field or whatever, it, it creates a tremendous dissonance for our children about what their purpose and their calling is. And, and I'm not saying that, you know, I understand, listen, I, I've got a, a, a child married and out of the house. I got two in college. I got high school, junior high, two in elementary school. Okay, we are concerned about our kids' futures, right? We, we want them to get good grades, and we want them to go to college, we want them to get jobs and provide for themselves and all that stuff, which is so important. But, but I'll tell you a scripture that God has been convicting me about lately, just in, in regards to my own parenting. It's Jesus's words from Matthew 6, 33. Jesus says, this, the context here is Jesus is talking about worry. He's saying, you're worried about all the stuff in your life. You're worried about your clothes. You're worried about your money. You're worried about your food, all the stuff in your life. And this is how he ends it. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added to you as well. And the conviction that the Holy Spirit has been putting on me these last couple of months is, Rob, do you really believe that verse? Do you really believe what Jesus says here as a parent? Okay, think about it. Jesus says that if my children will seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, that he promises to take care of everything else in their life. He'll take care of their school. He'll take care of their sports. He'll take care of their college. He'll take care of their job. He'll take care of all the stuff that we worry about if they will seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. I'll tell you, it changes how I parent. I'll give you an example. My son, who um, again just graduated from college, he was a college baseball player. And um, he was, a couple of years ago, he was in a slump, uh, in a batting slump, and dad was getting stressed out, okay, with the kid's batting slump. And so I'm on the phone with him before a game. And I said, hey, RW, I just want you to know, man, I am praying for you tonight. I'm praying that God will give you confidence at the plate, 
praying that he's going to help you see the ball well, praying that he's going to give you a couple of hits tonight. And he said, my son says, Dad, thanks for praying for my hits, but I'd rather you pray for my heart. I'm like, hmm, good point, son. Um, because here's what was happening for him. As, his, as he's having this batting slump, he's starting to feel anxious. He's starting to feel embarrassed with his teammates. And he understood that what was way more important than him hitting a baseball was his heart being at peace and his heart being at rest and just trusting God with this, that he's going to go out and do his best. Maybe he's going to get a hit. Maybe he's not. And so I, th there's such urgency right now in our parenting during this, this chaotic time. I mean, if, if there's a time to be praying for our neighbors who don't need Jesus during our family prayer time, I mean, this is it not just praying for them. God, would you open a door for us to talk about Jesus directly with this neighbor who, who doesn't know you? I mean, the world is scared right now. Again, all people talk about is sickness, death, <laughs> riots, war, civil war. The, the answer to this stuff is Christ. And there's a reason why Christians don't freak out about the virus and death the way the rest of the world does. Okay, and that's not to say we're not taking it seriously, but we don't freak out and we're not afraid because we know this world's not our home. This body's not my permanent body. You see, if you're apart from Christ, this body's all you got, which is why you obsess about your health. This life is all there is. So you try to prolong it. You just want to stay alive because you don't know what happens after this. A Christian has a totally different worldview. Our heart and our focus, our desire is on eternity. And we've got this message for, for this world that's so scared right now, literally about death and dying and war and chaos, this message that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. And I'm just convinced that in, in my home, these are the areas, and, and this is an area where I know God is kind of calling me up uh, to some more, to more faithfulness during this time of pandemic parenting. So those are some of the thoughts I wanted to share with you. And it's your turn. I think Jenna's going to help field some questions here. All right. Yes, Rob, thank you so much. Um, that was fantastic. I love everything you said. Oh, gosh, I just love that last point that you made. I mean, if ever we have a platform, it's now. So, you know, yeah, just amazing stuff. Um, a couple questions. One question that came through um, when you were talking about the, the family worship night, which I absolutely love that idea as well. And um, I know that can feel a little daunting to parents sometimes. You know, we, we, are, um, we are busy families. And um, one family came through with a question, you know, what does a typical family worship night look like in your home? You mentioned the highs and lows. Is there another example maybe you can give us um, just to kind of share those ideas with our families so they might uh, implement this? I know their hearts are to implement this. I think they maybe just don't know how or it feels like it might be a little tough to pull off, honestly. So how do you, tell us more about that. Sure. Well, again, remember the driver for family worship, just like church, is not discipline and we have to do it. It's neediness that our family, I mean, we sin at home every day, Jenna, I, I, folks watching, maybe you guys are more hol holier than us, but we've got sin in our house every day that needs to be confessed or we need God to help us with our relationships. So we have a, a, a need to pray as a family. And we also have a need for, for God's word, just reading his word together. And sometimes it's uh, reading a Psalm. Sometimes it's reading through the gospels. Sometimes it's reading the, uh, in, in Proverbs. And, and it's, you know, we've got this uh, little proverb at home. It's not from the Bible. It's a modern proverb. It's uh, from G.K. Chesterton. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly. And what that means is that your family worship time doesn't have to be this huge, giant mountaintop experience, right, where you've got this object lesson and you've got songs and Bible reading and discussion and prayer and catechism. Now, hey, if you've got uh, stuff lined up and different ages are engaging, praise God, hallelujah. But you know what? Just getting together at the end of the day. Hey, how can we pray for each other before we go to bed? One person shares a request, one person prays. You know, sometimes 
<laughs> Sometimes family worship in my house uh, looks like this. Kids, your dad's exhausted. Let's pray. God, help these kids fall asleep fast. Amen. And that's uh, be gone. I don't want to see you. And you're like, well, that's not, that's not very good family worship. Well, no, it's not. It's just all I have right now. Um, better to do a five-second prayer at the end of every day than, uh, than, than nothing at all. And sometimes at our family worship time, we'll, we'll read a scripture. You know, I'll try to start a conversation. You know, what did God speak to you through that passage or whatever? And I just, I get the sense that my little congregation is eager to conclude. Um, <laughs> so in those moments, I conclude. I just say, hey, are you guys like tired? We, is this not a good night? Yeah, dad, we're really swamped, got homework, or whatever. Okay, who wants to pray? No big deal. We're just gonna wrap it up in a lot of grace. I, we want everybody to be there. This is not torture. And uh, we'll try again tomorrow. So um, I, I would point any, any families that want some ideas for family worship. Uh, we've got lots of resources at our website, visionaryfam.com. Oh, and also, uh, Amy and I do a podcast every Monday. Uh, our podcast is on any podcast service that you use. And in fact, today's episode and next Monday is all about family worship. Great timing. What is it? Uh, how do you do it? You know, how do you do this in a way that doesn't drive your children insane? Uh, our podcast is called uh, Family Vision, Family Vision, or you can search Visionary Family Ministries. Just subscribe on whatever. And uh, Amy and I will talk about our journey with family worship. Yeah, perfect. Well, that's that's awesome. Um, I think your point of it doesn't have to be complicated is such a valid, good thing. And um, I just feel like that could be such a grounding for our families right now. Everything that, you know, all the chaos, that's just such a sweet, special time. What a great time to start family worship. So yeah, we'll go check out your podcast even better. That's awesome. Um, Lana, what are you seeing? What do you have a question over there for Rob? Yeah, a great question just came in, Rob, just asking, um, oh, am I muted? I'm okay. Okay, good. Um, asking about, you know, just talking about um, how, uh, what other, other opportunities do we have to teach uh, lasting spiritual truths to our kids? Um, and a lot of the fact that, you know, we're having to talk about having love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, you know, we're not commenting on mask and that stuff, but what other opportunities do we have to teach other lasting spiritual truths to our kids during this pandemic? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I think a lot of it overflows, like what are we gonna do by way of love of neighbor and impact for our community? I don't mean to go back to the family worship thing, but your spiritual life flows out of that family worship time. So if you began praying for your neighbors during the family worship time, or even just you come to your kids and you say, you know, I just have this, this, I, I know God wants us to use our family in this neighborhood or this apartment building as a light for Christ. And sometimes I don't know, like, how do we do that? How does that how does that work? Practically, what does it look like? So, hey, guys, what do you, what would you think about this? Why not every night this week, we're just going to pray and we're going to ask God to open an opportunity for us to bless one of our neighbors? Because it's, I don't know what we do, bake a pie and bring it over. I, I don't know. But God knows. And it, I think if we pray and ask him how we could bless the people around us right now, I think that's a prayer he's going to answer. What do you guys think? You think we could pray a prayer like that? All right, sure, we'll pray a prayer like that. So you're going to put it in God's hands, and you're going to trust him to, to make it clear to you, and I think he will. Yeah, that's that's super cool and such a good point, too. Um, such a good time to reach out to others, and, and we all know that depression lifts, anxiety lifts when we serve others and get outside of ourselves, so I, I love that, and I love leaving it up to God as to what that looks like. Um, I think there's a lot of value in just letting our kids watch to see what God does. You know, does he, does he lead them across our paths and the next time we go out to check the mail, and then how neat to come back and, and report in, and how exciting as a family to watch how God is going to minister through us, and I, and I just, uh, that's like next level good right there. All right, here's one for you, Rob. Um, 
you mentioned the presidential election and the fact that you know you're not really talking about that too much with your little little ones there. Um, do you talk about the recent presidential elections with your kids? Obviously, your older kids, I'm sure you do, but I think they're meaning kind of at what age would you start talking about that? And if so, how do you address it with them? Boy, that's a huge question. We could do a whole other uh, chunk on that. Um, yeah, I we talk about political stuff in our house a, a, a fair amount. Um, the the background for that um, is that God, when He God establishes nations, okay, the Bible teaches that God establishes nations, raises them up, takes them down, and He raises He establishes leaders, and He takes them up and takes them down. He establishes governing authorities. He commands his people to pray for those in authority. Uh, and, and he commands authorities to serve him. Uh, I'm giving you an example of a conversation we have in our house with all our kids right now. Um, now, when God established the United States of America, he did something really unique in that the authority, normally down through history, when God establishes authorities, it's a pharaoh, it's a king. Uh, it's something like that. But when God established the United States, he gave the final uh, ruling authority of the nation to the people. And so the people of this country are obligated to use their voice and vote to serve God. So we're not the Babylonian, we're not an exile in Babylon. We are not the New Testament church in Rome. We are actually the God ordained rulers of our country according to God's will. He established the people as the final authority. So that means that we have an obligation to be obedient to God, to engage using our voice, using our vote, to do everything we possibly can to guide our nation toward godliness and laws and justice in ways that serve him. So with that framework, then we're going to talk about, well, what does it mean uh, for us to use our vote to speak up for the equal value, worth, and dignity of every single person, no matter the color of their skin, no matter whether they're in the womb or out of the womb. We're going to have those sorts of conversations. We're going to talk about economics from a biblical perspective. We're going to talk about uh, communism, and we're going to talk about dignity economics and what the Bible says about those things. On, I'm going to be really blunt with you right now. Way too many Christians have not been discipled that the Bible speaks to principles of civic government, okay? Let me just say that with too many Christians have not been discipled that the Bible speaks to principles of civic government. So that could be a whole seminar for another day. I'm sure it'd be very feisty, but yes, we're gonna try to have those conversations at home as best we can. Yeah, I know that's opening up a can of worms. Thank you for being gracious enough to you know, field field all our questions tonight. That's, um, that's, that's wonderful. And I know that there is a lot that goes into, into that answer. Um, thank you for, for fielding that. Uh, Lana, what else are you seeing there? Yeah, um, Rob, you talked at the beginning about how um, a lot of our 20s and such kids, even those that are coming from Christian homes and coming from Christian uh, schools are turning away from that a little bit and coming back and challenging parents. Do you have ideas for developing spiritual resiliency and grit in our kids during all this? Is the question about helping those younger kids who are about to enter some of that, the, the, the more chaotic worldview battles? Um, I can't tell specifically what, you know, age group they're coming from, but just, you know, are there things that we can do now with our kids at home to just yeah. you know, instill more spiritual resiliency? Sure. Okay. Well, I, I guess the, an answer could field both groups. In other words, the, the junior hire who's still at home and that 21 year old who may be struggling. At the heart of Christian parenting is building a heart-based love relationship with your child to help them build a heart-based love relationship with God. Your heart relationship with them is the conduit for their faith formation. 
So getting the right worldview curriculum in your home for your junior higher is not the, the essential ingredient. Now, some content could be very valuable and should be very valuable, but great curriculum does not pass through the brain of the parent to the brain of the child. Biblical truth passes through the heart of the parent to the heart of the child, and that passes through relationship. So if you want to shore up the faith of your younger child, it's going to be through the warmth of the relationship through which the discipleship and teaching happens. And if you have one of those older children that's struggling in their faith, similarly, the, the solution is not a great book for them to read, although that could be valuable. The solution is a deepening of the heart connection and the deepening of the relationship with the child, because once the, um, once the enemy kind of gets his hooks in, and a lot of deceptions take root, they become taken captive to the hollow and deceptive philosophies of the world. It, it's quite a process of God bringing grace and healing and truth to that young adult. And that happens through the warmth of the relationship with the parent, not uh, here's a great article that will fix you. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I, I love that thought. You know, a lot of times I think we're we're um, prone to just hand them some literature sometimes and and really what they're wanting is to hear from from us so thank you for that um rob one last quick question and we'll wrap it up here uh what is the best single piece of parenting advice you can give to parents of teenagers so that one is what we'll end with there all right well i'd reiterate what i said a minute ago your purpose is a heart-connected relationship with your child to help them have a heart-connected relationship with God. But if you ask me for the most practical thing that I would encourage you to do with your teenagers is reboot your prayer time with them and your time in God's word with them. I know we're going back to family worship, but so many families, when their kids are little, young elementary, they have a nightly prayer time maybe a Bible story time, something like that. And as the kids get older and as the schedules get crazy, that prayer time disappears and that intentional spiritual connection time disappears. I'm not saying you have to go tuck your 16 year old boy in at bed every night or whatever, but um, to reboot that time and you go to him and you just say, you know what, when you were younger, we used to have a touch base where we used to pray together just for a few, just for a minute or two every day. And, and I'm sorry that I've kind of let that slip by the wayside. And if it's okay, I'd like to kind of awkwardly try to reboot that with you because our lives are going to physically separate more and more in the years ahead. Pretty soon, you're not even going to live with me, God willing. But our, our, even as our lives physically separate, we want our hearts to get closer and closer together. When you leave the house, we want to have the best, most unified relationship we've ever had before. And that's going to happen by you and me spending more time together with God. Yeah, that's great. That's wonderful. Yes, I love that. I love that. Um, all right. Well, now I just want to direct you to a couple of other things. Rob, thank you so much. Man, you are that was so challenging, so fantastic. The thing I love about Rob, and I know you can appreciate after hearing that, I mean, he just, he doesn't mess around. He takes it right back to the word of God, right back to everything that's at the core of everything we believe. Uh, that sometimes, you know, I think we get caught up in other things that we really just don't get down to what, what is really important with our families. And boy, Rob, you hit the nail on the head so many times tonight. And I know our families appreciated that message. Um, so, so if you'll look, guys, at your emails that I've sent, attached to uh, the, I think the last one that I sent out was a huddle up packet. We're doing this because we know we're not meeting, you know, we're not meeting live, we're doing virtual, and we know that uh, so many of you appreciated the babysitting. So we're trying to find a little, a little uh, substitute for that where there's not, there's not a lot, but we've attached a huddle up with activities, there's a video in there every time. The, the activities can range all the way from littles to uh, uh, upper elementary. So 
we're hopeful that you're looking at those and using those with your families to give you a little bit of time with your spouse just to focus uh, to, on these pep talks. And within that huddle up package, we also have questions for you and your spouse. And tonight we've just got these listed out here. We'd love for you to, before your head hits the pillow tonight, and maybe as things quiet down a little bit, um, ask each other these questions. What's been your family's biggest challenge during this pandemic? In what areas have you seen your family grow during the pandemic? And then lastly, what's one thing you think your family will do differently uh, based on what you've heard tonight from Rob? Um, those questions just will help get, you know, hopefully get you thinking more deeply and really have some good conversation. Maybe it's been a while since you've had a real purposeful conversation with your spouse about your parenting. All right, here are some of the resources Rob mentioned. This is his website, visionaryfam.com. He's got great stuff on there. He's one of my favorites and I don't have a whole lot of favorites. So he's made the top, uh, top five list of my favorites for sure. So check that out. And then you can see the different resources that we're highlighting. Gosh, these are honestly just a few of the many resources that are on his uh, website. But the book there on the left, Healing Family Relationships, A Guide to Peace and Reconciliation. What an amazing book. What, a, what an interesting, difficult topic to tackle. And I know that that book's probably... Uh, a wonderful resource for those families who need that. Then visionary parenting, which I happen to have in my office and from the last time he came. I know a lot of you flooded our tables for his books last time he came. So um, you'll want to check that out. Visionary parenting, capturing a God-sized vision for your family. Just how all about being intentional with the way you're parenting um, and really setting a mission statement and, and, and um, just concentrating on what you want your home and your family to look like for the Lord. And then lastly, over there on the right, this one would be for those with teens, uh, living for Christ at home, a challenge for teens. Now I've not seen this, but he, he uh, made Can me- Can you learn. still hear me, Jenna? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you wanna that, chime in on that? Yeah, that is a devotional for teenagers okay. written by my daughter, Lissy. Ah, so no. one teen, and it's free on the website. It's a free ebook. Okay. So okay. from one teen to another, yep. about uh, my 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 daughter said, being a Christian teenager is not easy, especially at home. Yep. So it's about honoring parents and loving siblings and all that tough stuff. Perfect. I love that. All right, check it out. We're going to close in prayer. Father, it's been a great evening. We are so grateful for this time together. Bless our legacy families. Bless them, Father, as they walk through this difficult time. You are able. We are weak, but you are strong. And um, we can do it in your strength. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Tune in next time, too. Good night.